All right, good morning. It looks like our uh, attendee rate is slowing down a little bit, so we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Jody Rodney, and I am the VP of Marketing and Education for Plan America USA, uh, based outside of Chicago. Um, we thank you for joining the Plan Mecca Digital Mastery course. Uh, today is the first of our series, uh, and we have Dr. Michael Young joining us from Michigan with the topic of 3D Dentistry Roadmap, Paradigm Shift Ahead. But before we begin, um, I wanted to touch on a few housekeeping items. One, um, everybody will be muted by our host. Um, the only people will, who will have an opportunity to speak directly will be our moderators. If you experience any technical issues, please submit your issues via the chat function. Uh, we do have somebody who will be moderating that, um, and if there are any technical issues, we will try to address them as quickly as possible. If you have questions for Dr. Young, please submit via the Q&A function. Uh, we will hold, um, hold all questions until the end, and there is some time set aside at the end to answer, answer any questions that you guys may have. Uh, we anticipate his portion of the presentation to take approximately 50 minutes, uh, and we'll open it up to questions after that. So we are not restricted to an hour, um, but uh, so if there are questions, we, we will go beyond that um, if, if there are still questions coming in. Um, additionally, we are recording the webinar, um, and we will have the link available following the webinar. So we will send uh, an email later today uh, to everyone who is attending and for those who could not attend, and it will be posted on our website for, for viewing. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Young. Michael, take it away. Thank you, Jody. I'm Dr. Michael Young, as she said, and welcome to this webinar, 3D Dentistry Roadmap, the Paradigm Shift Ahead. I'm going to basically share my story, uh, my 3D journey, what I've learned along the way, sometimes the hard way, sometimes the easy way. Specifically, I'm going to talk to you about 2D and 3D imaging and whether it's time for a paradigm shift and how we're using this imaging technology. And I'm going to show you an all digital implant workflow start to finish that is a game changer. But first, a little bit about me. I am a 1994 graduate of the University of Michigan School of Dentistry. I have a private practice in Sterling Heights, Michigan. I'm an American Dental Association member. I was a trustee for the Michigan Dental Association for six years. I'm a mentor for the Coy Center for Advanced Dental Learning. I'm a sometime triathlete. Those are three of my teammates from a triathlon I did in 2019. We had a team that raised over $165,000 to fight blood cancers. This is what I call the party of eight. This is my own little Brady Bunch. Three boys and three girls. It's Mike and Cheryl instead of Mike and Carol. We got two dogs and no Alice. So full disclosure, I'm on the Plan Mecca Board of Education and I'm KOL. First, I believe in this technology it makes me a better dentist every day, and it gives my patients better experiences and more predictable and better outcomes. And second of all, I believe in this company. So how did I get to you today? Where have I been? Well, this is my mentor, John Coyce. I met some of my greatest friends through his teaching center in Seattle. And years ago, he said this, removal of tooth structure has a consequence. The more we move our preps down the axial wall of the tooth, the more we increase the risk to the tooth. Keep your preps in enamel and bond them for predictability. And he showed this study here, which talks about fractures are a leading cause, one of the leading causes of tooth loss. And it said, when the filling or restoration is just one quarter to one third of the intercuspal distance, that tooth is less than half its original strength. So we want to keep our patients from getting here. Because now imagine taking the silver filling out, what's left of that tooth? It's really a thin outside wall. And now if you're going to crown that, now you're taking away even part of that. So you need a root canal and a post and a core build up, and you're asking that post to do everything for this tooth and keep it together. And when I'm putting that post in, I'm thinking we maybe should be considering an implant. So we want to keep from getting there. And how do we do that in practice? How can we be minimally invasive, preserve as much tooth as possible? How do we put a temporary on that? 
that's easy to come off that's going to stay on until their next appointment. Is that temporary? Do you use adhesive? Does that affect how your restoration fits? Well, it struck me. You don't need to make a temporary if you can do it in one visit. So this was the start of my digital dentistry journal, or journey, sorry. Back in 2004, I got Sarah 3D. And this is what hey, Mike, I tried. I'm gonna hop in. Mike, yes. I wanna hop in real quick. We're having a lot of um, kind of scratching noises. Okay. Um, I don't think you're touching the mic. It doesn't look like it, but just nope. so you're aware. Um, Everybody else should be muted, but if you can just try and be as still as possible, that'd be great. Yeah, we Thank can do you that. so much. Okay, so this is what we do every day. Minimally uh, remove off the occlusal surface, preserve as much as much of the axial wall as possible. Take out the restoration, blend it in, remove any undercuts. And there's your crown lay, on lay, overlay, whatever you want to call it. That's a great service to the patient. This patient here, this is a live photo, obviously, a very large occlusal restoration. I've taken the occlusal with, look how much of the tooth I've saved. I've got a beautiful enamel ring to bond to. It's very predictable. And so what I've done is I've put the risk on the restoration, not the tooth. If there's a problem with the restoration, I can replace it. These restorations are very, very successful. At 20 years, almost 80%. The rate of failure, as you can see, is less than 30, or is due to fracture about 33% of the time. So I can deal with that. We just replace the restoration. It's far better than root canal post or an implant. So this is bread and butter, everyday dentistry. Plat can, CAD can, plan CAD easy. What about my other technology since then? I upgraded to the blue cam. In 2008, I wanted to do Emacs restoration, so I got the furnace. I still have that same furnace working. My milling unit needed a motor repair and then another motor repair, and it was soon replaced. Omnicam, and in 2013, I switched to E4D. And I had the cart for a few short months until the, the Nevo lap scanner and laptop came out. Bought a second laptop so I could do plug and play from room to room. Plan scan, scanner in 2015, I upgraded my Pro Max to 3D. It was as simple as getting a new sensor and software. I had the same machine from 2006, my Pansef. So that to me is a great a uh, situation where you can just do an upgrade with software and not have to change hardware as well. In 2017, I added the Formlabs 2 printer and the Emerald scanner. And this combination together, I had really had no idea at the time how much of a game changer this would be for my practice, but it changed so many different workflows and opened so many possibilities. And then last fall, we added the Emerald S scanner. So this right now is my, my puzzle, my call my digital dentistry puzzle, the scanner. I have my original E4D mill from 2013, still going strong, the Formlabs 2 printer, and my comb bean. So that's where I've been, but where are we going? Is Prince William telling the press what he said to his brother and sister-in-law? No, he's not. He's, he's saying, I now have three kids. And this, I know this from personal experience, three kids is a game changer. You need a different vehicle, three rows of seats, can't sit in the same restaurants. It's no longer man-to-man -man coverage. Now you got to do zone. It's a game changer. But what if you only had that one view? What would your opinion be? Are we looking at a square or are we looking at a circle? It really depends on where you're looking from. It's both, they're both true. But if you can look at more than one angle, you have a cylinder. How many times have you diagnosed your patient as having a square or a circle when you were really dealing with a cylinder? This study is from 1961. Now I can't even say that word. 
but we've known since 1961 that extensive disease of bone may be present even when there's no evidence on x-ray. Yet, the 2D x-ray has been considered standard of care. And your insurance companies, when you send in your root canal fill PA, they're judging you, they're grading you based on that x-ray. So this study by Patel, detection of periapical bone defects in human jaws. What they did was they took mandibular molars and they sectioned them. And they took scan, they did with an intraoral sensor, they did their 2D PA and they did a cone beam after. And then they removed the distal root and they put a two millimeter defect in the bone and they took before and after pictures of that. And then they did the same thing with a four millimeter lesion. And what they found was that the 2D PA only found the lesion 25% of the time, but the cone beam found it 100% of the time. So the problem with 2D conventional x-rays is that you're taking a three-dimensional person and you're flattening that information. It's not possible to, to not lose information. We can see in the mesial and distal and apical coronal directions, but we really can't see in the buccal angle direction. Cone beam can overcome that, but there have been concerns about exposures. This is the 2012 position paper from the American Dental Association Council on Scientific Affairs. Now I hate, hate to read to you and I know it's boring, but we're building a case here. And this is what it, it really says. Clinicians should perform radiographic imaging, including cone beam, only when they can justify that the benefits outweigh the risks. All radiographic examinations should be indicated clinically and justified appropriately, and they should not be performed for screening purposes. The clinician should prescribe traditional dental radiographs only when he or she expects that the diagnostic yield will benefit patient care. Cone beam should be considered as an adjunct to standard oral imaging. Cone beam may supplement or replace when the, when the uh, dentist feels that it outweighs the, uh, outweighs the risks. The clinician should limit the radiation dose of cone beam scans by using the lowest combination of output, field of view, and scan time. We have this study from UNC. The background is the range of doses produced by dental comb units is large, with some examinations approaching doses associated with medical CT imaging. And they're estimating that between one and a half and 2% of all US cancers may be attributed to CT. At the time, dosimetry of comb beam examinations for pediatric patients has not been established for many units that are currently used in orthodontic imaging. So what they did was they took child and adult phantoms and they used a ultra low dose technology from Plan Mecca and they changed the parameters, the field of view and the radiation and the time. And what they found was that they were able to get an average reduction in dose of 77% using ultra low dose technology. But and this is the key, and this is the game changer, there was no statistical reduction in image quality between ultra low dose and standard protocols. This suggests that patient doses can be reduced without loss of diagnostic quality. So as I said, this is the game changer. We now have the capability for better diagnosis. We can actually make a diagnosis and we can do it at lower risk to the patient and lower exposure. So we're gonna take a look at some images and compare. The images on the left, the top left is a low resolution image and the bottom is an ultra low dose, low resolution image. I don't think, at least I can't really see a difference there. On the right side in the upper right corner, we have normal resolution and we have ultra low dose normal resolution. Again, you can see the lesion there at, at the bicuspid and there's really no loss of quality. This now has high def resolution 
or high dose resolution and ultra low dose. I can't see a difference on the left side between the top and the bottom. And the same goes for the right. The same university, same people did another study using a different technology or a different machine, did the same exact study. They wanted to find out what would happen if they lowered the dose. So in this scan, they had their high resolution, they had standard, and then they did a quick scan and what they called a quick scan plus. Their normal high resolution image goes around 360 degrees and takes 600 frames. Their quick scan does half the rotation and has 73% less images taken. They found that effective doses are comparable to pans. So you can reduce the dose, but it also has a significant reduction in image quality. If you think about taking 73% less images, it's not possible to have the same quality. Let's take a look. You're soon gonna see some black lines, a little gap there. That's where an image is missing. So yes, they can achieve an, a lower dose, but they can't achieve the same quality and image. So let's look at a couple of different scenarios that you might have in your practice and what that looks like. So I'm gonna compare what I now call a 3D PA, the five by five ultra low dose and a digital PA. The ultra low dose five by five 3D PA has three microsieverts three micro and the digital PA has 10. Let's now look at a classic pan, 20. And now what I call a full, full, an eight by eight ultra low dose has nine. And a digital FMX has 171 microsieverts of exposure to the patient. So let's look at what that might look like in your practice, knowing what we know now. Mrs. Jones is gonna visit a 2D only practice as a new patient. And we're either gonna take an FMX and expose her to a 171 microsievert, or we're gonna take a pan along with four bite wings. Now, Mrs. Jones is gonna to go to a Plan Mac, a 3D ultra low dose practice. We could take a full scan, eight by eight, with bite wings, extra oral, intraoral. And this is now what we've exposed. So quite a difference. And if you add that up over a lifetime or a period of time, it may impact that patient's life. What if we have a toothache? I know this is a different Mrs. Jones. I have lots of Mrs. Jones in my practice. If we take the 2 DPA and we don't find anything, what do we do? We adjust the bite, send her home to wait for things to get worse. Do we send her somewhere else where she might get another image taken and more exposure? Or do we take the 3D comb beam on the first visit? This is Dan. I've known Dan since 1999 as a patient. He owns a local restaurant. Dan does not have time for fooling around He's very direct. He wants answers and he wants it now. In 2017, this PA was taken in 2017. He came to me and he said, Mike, and he tapped on 29 and he said, there's a problem with this tooth. He said, I can't chew on it. So we tested it, hot, cold, checked the bite, took the PA, didn't really see much. We adjusted the bite a little bit. He goes home. 2019, he comes back in, same thing. This is driving me crazy. It's not bothering me every day, but sometimes I can't chew on this tooth. We do some testing. Well, Dan, we can't really find anything. So we send him home. 2020, January, he comes back in and he tells me that he had been somewhere else because flat out he told, he thought I was full of you know what. 
because he was having trouble with this tooth. I mean, he wasn't losing his mind. He was sure there was a problem, but nobody could figure out what it was. Now, I was lucky that whoever he went to did not have a comb because he came back to me. And this is what we took. Now, I don't know why we waited until, 29, until 2020 to take this picture. But 29's got a big problem. And now we can treat it. This is another patient complaining on the upper right in the number two to three area. This is the 2D, obviously. Now here's the 3D. We can see a huge lesion involving both those roots. The buccal wall is blown out. And we had originally sent that patient home. This patient here now, we can see Pretty clearly, there's a problem with 13. It's had a history of root canal, obviously. And most of the time, if a root canal has been done before and there's an issue, I'll refer it to the endodontist for a retreat. But I can also see that 14 may be involved here. So I took the cone beam, and this is what we found. If you see there on 13, there's a missed canal. You can also see as you go through the apical views that the root on 14 is involved as well. So now rather than send this patient to the endodontist to do the retreat, I felt comfortable doing it myself just knowing that I had to treat that canal. Another aha moment. I've had 3D imaging in my office since 2015 and it was sitting there not helping me or my patients until I had faced this so many times where we did not find a diagnosis and people like Dan coming back and giving me a second chance and finally taking that 3D combi. If we have the ability to do it at a lower dose than the 2D, why not? So in my office now, we don't really take a 2D PA anymore. We go straight to the comb beam, five by five, ultra low dose, very low resolution. We can get a diagnosis. We keep our patient in our office. We solve their problems sooner. They're not going around suffering. They're not being referred somewhere else. They're not getting frustrated. This is 2D Mario. Take a look at his hands. This is 3D Mario. Now he can wear white gloves. The, the gloves before, his hands before were the color of his skin. The technology now, the 3D technology is so good. He can wear white gloves on a white background and yet we can still see amazing detail. This is like your 3D and your 2D imaging. Now this is one of my favorite games, maybe the best video game of all time, Sega Genesis NHL 94. This was awesome technology in 1994. Look at the detail or lack thereof. This is the newest NHL game. This last year, I walked down into the basement and my son and stepson are on the couch and I thought they were watching a live NHL game. They weren't, they were playing a video game that looks so real that I thought it was real. So this is what we're capable of today. So we've been dealing with this ALARA principle since 1973, which basically says, we need to keep the radiation dose for our patient and surroundings to a level as low as reasonably achievable. But the problem was we couldn't make a diagnosis. So now what's diagnostically acceptable? We can get a lower dose, but can you get a diagnosis? This is Bob, Bob moved. And there's a lot of scatter there. We can't make a diagnosis with this image. Studies show that patients move approximately 20% of the time. And studies based on image artifact recognition 
say the movement is as high as 41 and a half percent. This is a big problem when we're trying to take our images. We don't want to have to take another image and expose the patient more. So Plan Mecca has come up with what they call CALM, Automatic Patient Movement Correction. Let's take a look. company that has that technology. So I've heard dentists say they don't want to get the machine because they're afraid of what they're going to miss and they're going to get sued for not diagnosing. I know dentists are worried about the cost of this technology, but in my opinion, this is being very short-sighted. You can take a class to learn how to read these images. Plan Mecca offers a two-day class. You can learn how to diagnose. If you're not comfortable doing that or if you want a backup, you can send in for a report. You can get a radiologist to look at these. So that doesn't hold water with me. What we really should be asking is, what am I missing? What am I not diagnosing? What am I failing to diagnose? How many times am I sending my patient away without being able to make a diagnosis? As far as the cost, this machine pays for itself every single week that I'm in practice. My machine, if you finance it over five years, is less than $1,600 $1, per month. So in my opinion, the truth is you can't afford not to have 3D. It's your duty really to diagnose your patients. That's what they're coming in for. If you started a practice 20 years ago, you wouldn't think about not having uh, a, a 2D x-ray machine in your operatory. So if you're opening a practice now, you really shouldn't be thinking, I, I need to have 3D to be able to do my job. So we're not gonna discuss fees, but this case, this case, I've got lots of cases. If you don't diagnose, you don't get to do the treatment. So this is our paradigm shift, moving away from taking 2D images to 3D images. John Coyce, you know, has so many people from all over the world in his classes. And they might have all had, they've all got different backgrounds and different education. And there, there's lots of different ways to provide treatment, but there can only be one diagnosis. And it's important for us to be able to actually make that diagnosis. So this is incidental findings. They took a thousand scans and they found an incidental finding on 943 of those scans. This study, 92.8% they found an incidental finding, 90.7. So yes, there are gonna be things on, on these images. You need to learn how to read them and make a diagnosis and you're gonna find more treatment. So don't worry about the cost of the machine. Worry about what you're missing for your patient. So if your spouse, daughter, any family member has a problem or where are you going to send them? I want my kids, my wife being seen with a Plan Mecca doctor who's got ultra low dose technology. They're the only company that has this combination on the bottom. So moving from 3D imaging into all digital implant workflow. 
Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind, right? And in dentistry, when we're placing implants, that's very important. We don't want to use a generic crown. We want to actually design the crown to fit this patient. A study on risk assessment for periimplantitis showed nearly half of cases had been surgically triggered by implant malpositioning. This is pretty obvious, but correct 3D implant position has been pointed out as a pivotal factor for optimal aesthetic outcome. So let's look at this 2D PA. It's been typical after you place the implant, right, to just take a 2D PA and see how it looks. That looks great, right? But what about 3D? What does it say? Well, it shows that the implant is out the buccal plate. So how many times have we sent patients home a little overconfident? This study in 2018, Eunice, they wanted to look at the accuracy of free-handed or brain-guided or mental-guided, whatever you want to call it, pilot, pilot drill guided or partially guided and fully guided implant surgery in partially edentulous patients. So that apical global deviation you saw there, the implant move, that's what they were measuring. So in the brain guided, the mean was 2.11, but the maximum was 4.84. The pilot guide had got a lot better or it improved some. The maximum was still 2.72. The fully guided was less than one. Eunice said, it's been shown that cement rem remnants around are common around implants and may contribute to the development of periimplantitis. I don't know about you, but I have had a specialist who placed an implant call me and wanted to blame me because there was inflammation around the implant, the implant was failing, and they said it must be from cement that I had to have left around the restoration. I don't want to deal with that. Eunice said 19.2% of the implants installed by metal navigation may be expected to receive a cement retained restoration. Now, if we did partially guided, it went all the way down to 4.2. But if we can do it fully guided, in this study, 100% were screw retained restorations. So I've eliminated my risk of leaving cement around that too. In this study, the fully edentulous cases the probability of positioning error. 88% of the time with freehand, there was a positioning error, but 6% when using a computer and fully guided. I want to thank Wally Renee for this slide. It pretty much says it all. In conclusion, we need to plan what we're doing beginning with the end in mind. Print a surgical guide, do it with a guide. This is what I used to do. We would take an impression, probably have to take a second impression because we know like 86% of the time there's an error. And then we send the impression to the lab. We're referring for a comb beam. And what have we done? Patients can't even take uh, medications as they're prescribed. They can't follow directions. Have you ever given them post-op sheets? and they don't read the sheet and they call you with the same, with a question that's answered on the sheet. So we've referred them out to an imaging center. I've completely lost track of the patient. I forget about them, they're out of sight, out of mind. If the patient actually made an appointment with the imaging center, how long does it take to transfer the comb beam to the lab so we can start to plan the case? Now I'm gonna wait for the lab to call me or email to schedule an online planning session. I'm gonna accept the invitation wait for the appointment, spend time in an online meeting planning the case. Now, who's planning the case for me? Is that person a dentist or is that some guy that they hired in the lab for $15 and he learned how to do this? So now I'm going to wait for the lab to print and ship the guide and control the cost and everything. And then we wait for the patient's appointment. This literally could take months. And this is what it costs. They charged me $125 to plan and $135 for the surgical guide, and then $50 for a sleeve. This is the actual 
wording and price on the invoice I received. The stone model, I don't know why they have stone model. Why didn't they 3D print it? Maybe they did, they just put stone model. Shipping handling, $13, taxes, refund for wasted time, $0. And that is a lot of wasted time. That cost me over $361. all digital fully guided in office with my scanner, with my comb beam, with my mill, with my printer using Romexa software, which is the key using cam log implant and I use Vulcan lab. Let's look at this. Here's the intraoral scan. Here's the opposing arch. This is the restoration designed in plaid, plan CAD easy. Here's the comb beam. Now we're going to fit, we're going to merge those models together, the comb beam and the interoral scan. We're just going to pick three spots. And I would do this a little differently today. I'd probably pick something on lingual as well. And you're going to see this snap right into place beautifully. In a moment, you're gonna see the restoration because we also designed that in Romaxis and it recognizes where it's supposed to be. It snaps right into place. So we don't have a generic crown. We have a crown that's appropriate for this patient in this spot. And we're just checking to see adaptation there. So, also right in room access, I, don't, I can sit at the same laptop or same computer. I go into the surgical guide mode, uh, application. This is so easy to do. It actually takes longer to export the file than it does to design the guide. Here's the printed model, the surgical guide. I don't print the model anymore because I know it fits. Here's the day of placement. Here's we're trying in the abutment and the final restoration. So remember before I paid $361, how about now? Now this is a screenshot from the Form Labs 2, oops, sorry. From the Form Labs 2 website. Now you can disregard the first line because this is what they're saying it costs to export a file from a different software. But what we're looking at here is the cost of the resin to print this. $4.39 and then 74 cents worth out of the, out of the resin tank guide. And then also note $5.40 for the sleeve. The lab was charging me $50 for the sleeve. So now this is costing me about $12 and 13 cents. So if you take the cost of the software and you figure out what you save each time, it's less than 13 fully guided cases and you've paid for this software. And I get to keep control. I'm not referring out, I'm not waiting. I can literally do this same day in my office. $12. And what about the restoration? That's the planning of the placement. Now let's look at the restoration. I'm going to use True Abutment, which is an outstanding lab to work with, my mill and my scanner. So very simply, we take out the healing abutment and we scan the tissue. I want to show you that, notice where it says Shade B2. With the new scanner, we have Shade. So now we're going to put in the scan body. and I export those files to my desktop. Now this is crucial. If you have a system that doesn't export and import files very well, this may be a very complicated case for you to do. I also want you to notice that the lab is using Reshape software. Plan Mecca's files 
play great in this lab software. They're open, export, import, very easy. So what I do is I export to the desktop and I've got a shortcut to a Dropbox shared folder with the lab person that I work with at True Abutment. And within about two days, he sends me these pictures. This is, is the design of the abutment and the crown. And I say yes. And as soon as I say yes, they mill the abutment. And about two or three days later, I get an email with a file for the crown. Here's the abutment tried in. And this is the key right here. Notice the, on the left side there in the menu, import from milling. I click on import from milling. I go to select. I go to my desktop where I've downloaded the crown, crown file to, and I select it. And this is what happens. The milling tab in the software opens up. And here's the occlusal view. They design it with an access opening for me to perfectly fit. I mill the crown. And this is what it looks like. That is an excellent fit. With the mill from 2013. There's the access opening. There it is in the mouth. Now, if I have an issue, I can remove the composite and the access opening, tighten the screw, whatever it might be. But what I can do is I cement that in my hands. So I try in the abutment. I screw it in, make sure it's seated. Then I try the crown on it, try them both in together, make sure there's no problems with insertion. And I remove it and I cement it in my hand and I can clean up all the cement so that there is zero cement around that restoration. If I have an implant that's placed by a surgeon, I'm not getting blamed for cement around an implant anymore. So what did this cost me? The scan body is $25 and you can autoclave it. And True Abutment's got scan bodies for just about every implant. It costs $204 for the milled titanium abutment and the design file for the crown. And then I pay about 34 bucks for the block. $263. Traditional lab workflow. I was working with an excellent lab in Michigan. The impression is $16, right? Remake because 86% of the time there's a defect in the impression. $517 for a milled abutment and crown. So for the total workflow, the planning, the restoration, if we're doing all digital, we're saving $635 each time you place an implant or restore an implant. So for those wondering how this might affect your break even point, if you were to get a new scanner and your Emacs lab fee, if you're sending crowns to the lab, you need to do about 20 crowns a month to break even on this system. If you do what I just showed you, an all digital implant workflow, you only need to do 14 crowns a month if you do just two implants. Now they can be from a surgeon that refers you back for the restoration. You significantly save and reduce the break even point on that milling unit. Let's look at another case, all digital fully guided using true abutment again in my mill. So this is the report that they send back. Shows their planning. Again, it's three shape software. The surgical guide design. To give you a beautiful report. And this is the guide they printed. So if, if you don't want to print your guide or um, you, you wanted somebody else to help plan it for you, you just want a different set of eyes just for confidence, whatever it might be, or you don't have the time, you can have True Abutment do all that for you. Pay attention here. Now notice the notches in the sleeve for this implant system, the Uris. When they send you back the guide, they, they send you a PDF file. And this is reminding you here to line up the flat part of the hex there, the notch on the sleeves, to the notches in the surgical guide. This is for the timing of the implant. So $150 for them to plan it 
and to print that guide. Before I was outsourcing that, remember, for a total of $361. Here's the implant going in place. In this particular case, and the reason why I wanted to show you is because this is exactly how you reduce visits to the office, how you reduce your overhead. We wanted to do a custom abutment in this case to shape the tissue. And because we did it like that and we used the Eurus implant, I can put this implant in there just like that to shape the tissue. Now, if you wanted to place a temporary crown, you could have them design the crown and the custom abutment and you could put a temporary crown on that same day. You could even do the final restoration. Now how many, and, and put it in later obviously, but how many steps does that save you? How much money does that save you? You've done it one time. You don't have to come back, put another scan body in there and, and do a whole nother process. So there's the placement. I'm not taking a 2D picture after anymore. I'm taking a 3D picture. So this is what that all looks like. If you have them plan it and, that, and, and True Abutment print the guide, you're still saving almost $500 a case. Either way, you're saving money. So the key to all this is Romexis. It's the brains of the operation. Scan, plan, and create all in one software. Everything works well together. Look at all these, uh, all these different modules you can add. The beautiful part is the dentist gets to choose what they want to do and when they want to add it. It's really a license key. They unlock the license key for you and you've got the module. So the four pieces of the digital dentistry puzzle working together. Key points I think that are important with Plan Mecca that you need to be careful when you're looking at technology is the total cost over five years. Plan Mecca has a very, very low cost over five years for their CAD CAM system. The warranty and support are second to none. The CAD CAM system is 50% less than the other full system. There's proprietary ultra low dose 3D and Calm. Romexis software, which is the game changer. Freedom of choice to add modules. Software updates versus hardware updates and open architecture files. So we're dentists and we're business people. And if you're out of business like we are right now due to this virus, you're realizing that maybe more than ever. So digital technology helps us be smart business people while providing better care for our patients. You can never let the business part be more important than the healthcare part. And in this case, you don't have to. They work synergistically together. If you look at what's happening right now, if you search changes in dentistry, well, maybe before this virus, but you would find that we're going more digital, there's more group practices, and there's more focus on patient experience. Every patient can walk out of your office and leave a great review or a bad review for all the world to see. We have clinics owned by dentists, going to clinics owned by corporations who've got more buying power, experience, they have a better marketing budget, I was told by my website company, Mike, you can't possibly outspend your competition in the area. They've got more money than you. So what are you gonna do? I'm gonna suggest you differentiate. A lot of pressure on us right now. Maybe now is the perfect time to start considering when you get back to business, how digital technology can affect your overhead and your patient care.
if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Thank you very much. That concludes my part. Thank you very much, Dr. Young. We have um, several questions. Okay. Uh, we'll kind of take them one at a time. Uh, the first one is, are you utilizing medical reimbursement for coverage for billing via dental? And are you getting coverage? Personally, I have not done that yet. That's on my radar. Um, I've heard some people are getting coverage for implants and so forth. We have not. Um, we decided that we were going to charge a PA uh, when we take the 3D and we're just going to take an image uh, screenshot and save that as the 2D PA if we needed it, but we're not medically billing as of yet. Okay. Thank you. Um, next one. How would you recommend routine follow-up and assessment with implants? Generally, the scatter and beam hardening issues don't allow for adequate assessment of marginal bone loss. Has that changed? Is it predictable? Well, I think it's, I'm not taking a, a 3D image later on. I'm generally only taking it at the time of placement. So I haven't, I haven't compared that, but the, the image that I showed you there, um, I thought it was it was pretty clean, at least the, of the day of placement. I didn't have a problem seeing the bone there. I haven't really gone back later on and taken another cone beam. I don't know if that answers the question. Hopefully. All right, next. Um, is there a case where calm should be turned off? We always keep it on at our practice, but I'm wondering why there's an option to turn it off. Well, I freedom of choice, I guess, but it's on in my office and we never switch it off. Um, we basically, I brought everyone over to the machine and I said, this stays on. Um, and base, I almost take all of my images ultra low dose too. That, that doesn't change for, for anything really. Great. All right. Um, so the next one is, do you know how many watches and observations that you had in your charts prior to adopting the technology? Was it a couple of weeks, a couple of months? And how has that changed now that you're taking 3D PAs instead of intraoral? By watching, I'm assuming um, cases where we couldn't make a diagnosis and we- Correct. Yep. I, I never, never really tracked the amount, um, but I can tell you over 25 years of experience, um, there's been so many times where we couldn't really figure it out. We did a bite adjustment and sent them home. And you know, surprisingly, some of the times that worked but a lot of the times it didn't. I, it's not something I've ever tracked. Um, it's only been recently when it basically smacked me in the face that, you know, I realized why, if I have this capability, why am I not doing this? So it's not something that I've tracked, um, but the numbers that I showed you in the, those cases, those are all within the last few months. Uh, and I'm sure there's been a ton more that I, obviously we don't have time to run through every case, but it's just not something I've tracked. Right, right. So for the next ones, I think that um, they were sent a little bit earlier during the presentation. And I think that you've answered most of them, but um, we'll go ahead and just put them out there to, to make sure that we're, we're answering them cor correctly. But since making the sh your shift in your thinking and moving from 2D to 3D, do you feel that you're using your digital impression and uh, scanner and mill more? Um, well, yeah, I mean, if I'm diagnosing a, a root canal, you know, now now they need a crown generally, at least if it's in the posterior. So, I mean, I guess that would make us use it more. Um, you, the, the true abutment was really the game changer for me as far as um, using the mill more when restoring implants, because I don't have to send that out anymore. I don't get, I, I'm doing the crown, you know, milling myself instead of a lab making. So it definitely affects that case. Um, but the 3D really, it just, you're just diagnosing more. So you're getting to do everything more. Yep. Um, and then the next one, you just kind of touched on it, but um, do you do the milling of the guide in your office? Well, we 3D print them. Yep. Yep. And um, how much time do you spend on guide planning, milling, et cetera? So that process is actually so fast. Um, recently, mm -hmm. I treated my father uh, last year, my dad came in, they live, my mom and dad live about three and a half hours away. And at his recare visit, he mentioned to the hygienist that he's, his tooth was bothering him. And the hygienist in this case actually took the cone beam um, 
sometimes, you know, just for ease of use, they would take the 2D PA right in their operatory just because they, they have an hour to treat these patients and they move through. Now, I look back, they actually took the comb beam, which I thought was really cool. Um, maybe it's just because my dad, we have to have a talk about that. But anyway, we noticed pathology then. Dad needs an extraction. So we extracted the tooth. Next we care visit. He comes in first thing in the morning. He's my first patient. We scan the mouth. We design the restoration. He gets the cone beam. I merge the files. It literally takes me less than a half an hour to do the scanning, do the restoration, do the implant planning. The longest part of the whole process is the 3D printing of the guide. So dad came back after lunch, got an implant the same day. So I would say uh, once you're efficient at this, it's not very long at all. And you really could do it in one in one day, in the morning, if your printer is fast enough. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and the next one, um, I think that there's multiple options here and you did touch on it, but the milling of the abutment, abutment is done in the lab and the crown in your office? Yes, so true abutment mills the titanium abutment. They send it to me, uh, you know, they ship it to me and they send me the file. I mill the crown in my office and I, I actually have the, the crown milled before I even get the abutment. But that whole process is probably less than two weeks from when I send it to them to when the patient can be appointed to put the crown in the abutment in. Great, thank you. Um, somebody asked which milling machine you're using. I have my E4D mill from 2013. Um, I find that if you do what you're supposed to and you do the maintenance, um, then it's gonna last a long time. Um, it's, I don't want to jinx it. Um, so that's seven years I've had that mill and it's, it's working great. Great. We love to hear that. <laughs> All right. Uh, here's a, a little bit longer, uh, a comment and question from a doctor. Um, I'm not doing implants yet. Um, and, but she's most interested in the pros of the CBCT for general restorative practice. She's been wanting to, uh, purchase one for the last year and just hasn't done it yet. Have you abandoned uh, digital FMX and PAN, or do you do all radiographs with your CBCT now? How do you incorporate that technology during routine hygiene uh, patient recare visits? Well, that's where we're going. Um, as I mentioned during the webinar, if you're starting a practice now, I, I wouldn't even think of starting without having ultra low dose 3D um, because it's just far better diagnosis. Now we've just finally, after you know, being hit over the head in a way, started to take the 3D PA all the time. We will begin to take full uh, eight by eight images and, re and use that to replace the pan in the FMX. Uh, one little step at a time, but that's definitely where we're going. And if we were starting from scratch, I definitely would do that right off the bat. Great, thank you. Um, also from the same doctor, I have a TRIOS digital scanner and send those files to the lab. If I want to incorporate milling in the office, will the Plan Mecca mill work with TRIOS or does it only work with Plan Mecca scanners? If you're asking if the TRIOS will work with a Plan Mill, the answer is yes. Correct. Yep. Yeah. So All right. The answer is yes. Yeah, exactly. So, the the that's, open that's system allows for the integration. That's another important part um, that I tried to hit on. Uh, with Romexis, because of the way the files are, the open architecture, you can piece different technologies together. So, I mean, if you already have a scanner from a different company that you like, that's fine. It will work with Plan Mecca technology. You can import uh, the files into the comb beam. It, it all works together. And that, to me, is huge. We're not saying you only can use this. I mean, we'd like that, right? But if you already have a scanner, if you already have a comb beam, the parts will play together. Great. All right. Um, and then someone asked, um, were you suggesting at the beginning of your presentation that you could replace bite wings with low resolution scans? Uh, from my experience, even high resolution scans are not diagnostic for caries. No, we still take bite wings. Uh, I don't use those images for caries diagnosis, I would agree with that. Um, we still take the, the four bite wing series. All right. 
With a surgical guide, do you use key reducing system for start drill? And if so, which one? Key reducing system. No, I don't. Okay. Um, are you able to mill all zirconia crowns with the plan mecha system? Yes, you can. Correct. I don't personally do zirconia restorations. Um, so it's not something that I'm particularly interested in, but I know a lot of doctors are, and the answer is yes. Um, does CEREC work well with implant planning and placement along with the fabrication of surgical guide? Huh. Read that. Does CEREC say does that CEREC again? work well with implant planning and placement along with the fabrication of surgical guide? All right. So, um, I think it does within its own system, probably with a, maybe a CEREC specific lab. I don't know that you can work with just any lab you want. Um, they say you can, um, but I know specifically, I've had some friends that have tried to do it and there have been some issues. The, the, the key point is to be able to get the files out of the system easily so that you can work with other, um, other labs and have the freedom of choice. So I, I think they're saying you can, but I really haven't seen it. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone else get artifacts in their 2D bite wings and PAs? How do you get rid of them and can you use Calm in a 2D setting? No, it's only for the 3D. Um, yeah, you know, it's 2D radiography, right? You're, you're gonna get 3D image, uh, 3D information smashed flat. So unfortunately, there's going to be artifacts sometimes, and, and they're just they're just not perfect. Uh, are there training classes providing by Plan Mecca to learn all this workflow that we are talking about? Absolutely. So I can tell you that as as part of the Board of Education, we spent a weekend in December together uh, planning a new curriculum. And these classes are already starting to take place. Uh, Dr. Peter Green, I know, has already given uh, a two-day class on reading your scans. So um, this is very important to Plan Mecca, and I, we want you to be able to confidently and comfortably use the technology. So the answer is yes, there, there's training. It's, it's in Chicago now. Yep. And I'll just uh, piggyback on that one. So if you go to planmecca.com uh, slash training, you can see all of our courses. Um, we do have a, a pause on our in uh, uh, in Chicago based courses um, because of the coronavirus, obviously. Um, but we have our full schedule posted. Um, oftentimes, they're they're provided both by um, our internal employees as well as um, from doctors who we pull in for different um, clinical classes. So you can see our full offering um, at planmeca.com/training. All right. Um, how much of the digital workflow do you delegate to your staff? Great question. Um, a lot of it, but not all of it. So uh, there's been a learning curve with uh, cleaning up uh, models to get ready to 3D print. Um, so I've been doing that. Now I have a software that pretty much automates all that. So I just have to train my assistant to do it. But my, when, I, when I first went to E4D in 2013, I went to Dallas to be trained with my two assistants. And when I came back, I didn't touch a scanner for basically five years. I didn't design a crown. Um, I was, unfortunately, uh, my main assistant, uh, one of my two assistants, one that had been with me the longest, injured her back and had to have emergency surgery. And I had a newer assistant who wasn't trained. And so I had to relearn how to do it. And after five years or whatever, I figured it out. But I try to delegate as much as possible and specifically CAD CAM. If you're looking at um, trying to break even compared to a traditional workflow, taking the impressions any lab, you have to delegate that. Absolutely. Um, there's still need to learn how to do the implant planning. I'll, I'll do the implant planning. They could probably fabricate the surgical guide. So as much of the CAD CAM as possible, the assistant should be doing. I'll plan the implants and they can do the surgical guide and clean up models for 3D printing. There's actually a um, follow-up question uh, from a different user or a different attendee uh, asking similar question uh, related to the staff. So 
uh, change is not fun and uh, their staff's opinion and experience with technology matters. If your staff were on this call, what would they say they like best about the scanner, the mill and 3D unit? Well, they say, well, I'll tell you what, um, they actually like it because it's fun. Um, so when I mentioned early on that when we added the 3D printer and the Emerald scanner, that changed a ton for us. Um, when we had the plan scan scanner and I asked them to do a full mile scan, they kind of gave me dirty looks because it, it took a while and the Emerald scanner was a game changer. So now we could do full arch scanning much more quickly. And then with the 3D printer, we started to get cases where you could see their, their brains working. Hey, we don't have to send this to the lab anymore. We can do this in office with a 3D printer um, and we can, we can do it ourselves. So they actually like it. Um, now with the Emerald S, the, the scans are even faster. Sometimes they would, they would fight me if they felt like they were in a rush and we didn't have the time. They'd say, look, an impression is just faster, you know. Um, but that's changing now with the S, so they actually really like it. You're right, change is hard. Um, you're, you have to have your staff on board, and there, there are ways to integrate this into your office to make it easier, but it can be done. And bottom line is, I, I think especially in this time right now, I think our employees are very sensitive to the business because we're not in business. Um, we have to be mindful of what things cost, what our workflows are costing us and ways to save money. I think it now might be the best time to get into this and they're all gonna be on board because they're gonna be happy to work. Yeah. Uh, can your software create occlusal guards? So Romaxis doesn't do that for me now. Um, I actually use a software called D3 Splint. So if you look up D3 tool online, you will find their software. They've actually just uh, released a new software called D3 Lab. So this software will help clean up models, base models, so you can print them. And um, they have the D3 Splint where I can make night guards. When I first started doing this, like I said, a couple years ago when we got the printer, um, the workflow was a little clunky and it didn't always work. But the company is very responsive and they've made great improvements. It takes me now less than 10 minutes to design a night guard, start to finish, and then about 45 minutes to print. So if you had a patient that had a TMD issue that was acute, you, you probably could do a scan and make a night guard and send them home with that the same day. Or a deprogrammer, something, something along, along those lines. Thank you. Um, so Plan Mecca has a 3D PA or are you extrapolating and are you billing for the PA? Well, we can take it down to a five by five image. So I'm calling that a 3D PA. Um, I'm, I haven't, I've been doing them at no charge. Uh, and that's something that each office has got to figure out for themselves. If I'm planning an implant, I don't charge for the scan. If I'm trying to get a diagnosis, I don't, I haven't charged for the scan. I haven't felt right about sending that as a PA to the dental insurance, but I've been told, Mike, you don't have to feel bad. Just take a still image and, and send it. Um, so that's what we're going to do. But other than that, I don't, I haven't charged for it. Okay. Uh, Michael, great presentation. Do you foresee this technology for use in pediatric dentistry in the future? Well, certainly for orthodontics um, and growing kids. Now, I don't, you know, if you wanted to do inlays or restorations with CAD, um, you could. Um, I haven't done that before. I'm, I'm not sure that, that I would, but certainly for, for diagnosing and for orthodontics, um, I think it's important to see the teeth in the bone when you're doing orthodontics so that you, you don't move teeth outside of, of the bony housing. So I think that would be a great application for sure. Great. Uh, which implant system do you use? Um, lately, I've been using Uris. Uh, it works so well with um, true abutment, but I've done a lot of cam log as well. And I found that system, um, I was using the cam log easy. Prosthetically before, it was a little bit of a challenge. Um, but now that we have this workflow, it's a lot easier for me to use. So I'm, I'm probably moving from cam log to Uris. 
All right. We've also done some uh, dentist implants as well. Okay. Um, does Planmeca uh, Remexis integrate with Blue Sky Bio software? Well, I don't, I don't know why you would want to use the two. Um, I suppose you could export something. I'm not sure what you want to export from Blue Sky and then, then put it into uh, Romexis. Um, it seems to me that you are that you don't need to. You would just use one or the other. I guess I would need to know what application, what workflow they're trying to accomplish. Okay, we'll see if he uh, gives a follow-up. Um, the, miss the first part of the webinar. What practice management software do you use and does it play well with Remexis? Great question. So we use Dentrix uh, and Dentrix and Romexis have worked together to create what they call smart image. That's what it's called, right? Yes. Smart? Okay. Yep. So um, we recently had this put in place in my office. And once we got a few wrinkles out, you know, like licenses and things like that unlocked, what we now have is the ability to look at all the imaging that we've taken uh, on the computer in each operatory. So before where, so it's important, first of all, to have your Romexis uh, connected to the network and all of your scans and everything saved on a server. And then you can actually have uh, your scanner, if your computer is good enough in each room, you could go room to room and just plug in. That is a huge, huge uh, game changer uh, you don't have to wheel this around on a cart. You can see all the images from Romexis and uh, De De Dentrix. We use Dexis and Dentrix, right? We use mm -hmm. Dexis scanners uh, and it goes into Dentrix. So yes, you can see everything. It plays very well together. I can now pull up the cone beam in any room in the office. I can pull up the internal scan in any in the operatory in the office. Um, and I don't think any other software or imaging company has that. So I think that is a, uh, a pearl for Dentrix and Plan Mecca. Yes, thank you. Um, and just got a comment from one of our reps that we do have a quick launch in Remexis to Blue Sky Bio. Okay. Um, okay. I consider big products like this important. Um, having local support is huge for me and I've had some bad experiences in the past. Um, tell me about your uh, support both locally and with the company, please. Um, I personally have not had any issues. Um, I've been w very well supported in the past and currently. Um, I, like I said, I had with the, uh, when I went to E4D, I had the five year support and warranty and every quarter uh, they were in here doing maintenance on the machine. And since then I'm paying them myself to do the maintenance. Um, now that the, the coverage has ended, um, I haven't had an issue with that. My experience is that if I'm making a call to Chicago, it gets taken care of. Um, I don't, I can't speak for local support in all areas of the country. I just know in Metro Detroit, it's been good for me. Great, thank you. Um, someone asked if you could repeat the name of the software for model, uh, model cleaning and splint design. So you can use Mesh Mixer and do it on your own. Um, there are plenty of um, YouTube videos that show that process out there. Um, they actually commented that Mesh Mixer is a pain and that yeah. they wanted to understand the, the one that you were using. Yeah. Mesh Mixer, it is a pain. And uh, D3 Tool, or so D as in David, 3 Tool, T-O-O-L, or they might, might look it up under D3 Mesh. They have software that automates the process with models. Um, you still have to you know, do a few clicks yourself but it, it does a lot of automation and it's very predictable now. Um, I know this, I don't wanna speak out of turn. I think this is gonna be something in the future that Romexis will do and you won't have to go to another software. Um, but for the time being, uh, you may. So D3 tool, D3 splint, D3 mesh, um, lots, of great, lots of great tools that they have for you. Great. Uh, can you upgrade to Emerald S without upgrading the mill? Yes. Okay, I, um, I'm not sure I understand this one, but the onlay restoration after RCT has built in post, should it be built only as a crown or post built up as well? I think they're asking about endo crowns. 
um, I'm guessing. I okay. personally don't really do them. I'll, I'll place a composite core uh, and do the restoration over that. And, and the remaining two, I think that's what they're asking. Um, there's been some discussion online. I, I think you, you can do, some people do endo, endo crowns very successfully, but I think there are issues that you need to be careful with. Okay. Um, is there an articulation like function within the software so that larger cases can be planned and milled via the digital workflow? Not in plan CAD easy. At the moment, there are softwares out there that you can use to do that. I have not done a big case like that yet. Um, that I believe is coming. And it's available in different software, but not in plan CAD easy. Okay, great. Um, so there's a doctor who just invested in the in Plan Mecca buying 3D Classic, Emerald S, and a printer, um, and is wanting some recommendations for webinars um, to do during our downtime right now. Well, uh, we're going to have how many webinars now coming? <laughs> uh, I was just going to say I can answer that one. Um, we've got um, a series of webinars that we are hosting um, with different uh, different clinicians over the coming month. Um, it, if you go uh, to the uh, landing page, um, Sid, if you can text me real quick what the link is for that. There's several that we are hosting ourselves um, in addition to some partners that we are doing through Dental Product Shopper and Viva Learning, um, but all of them will be on our landing page um, where you registered for, uh, for this webinar. It's info.planmecausa.com slash webinar. And that's info.planmecausa.com slash webinar. So we'll be hosting um, several a week, basically for the next three, or three to four weeks. Jody, I'll also suggest that um, if you're a Facebook user, there are user groups of Plan Mecca Fit users, I believe is the name of the group. Look that up, ask to join the group. You'll get lots of good discussion going back and forth there. There's also lots of videos online. Dr. Wally Renee from Medical University of South Carolina has got a ton of online videos. Um, you can learn a great deal from him. He's got, um, uh, I think he's got a YouTube channel. So you can find Wally Renee online and, and go through his videos. Great. Uh, is Remexis compatible with EagleSoft? Well, they don't have this smart imaging to, mm -hmm. to bring the images into the computer, uh, if that's what you're asking. So EagleSoft is really a um, separate application for you know, different purposes, I would think. But as of now, no, they don't have a, an integration with the imaging. All right. Um, why do you have a true lab mill implant when you can use prefabricated implants? Why do I have, say it's that again. True lab mill implant. When I can do my own? When you can use prefabricated. So I think it's why are you having a uh, true abutment mill the implant when you can use prefabricated implants? Oh, so like a, a tie base or something? Mm -hmm. um, personally, not a big fan of tie base. Um, I think if, you know, if I'm looking at how this restoration is going to emerge from the tissue. Um, I'm much more comfortable having a custom abutment made. Um, that would be my reasoning. And the expense is so low that I don't, I don't really see a, ne a need to do it the other way. I, I just prefer a custom. I think you're going to have much better tissue shaping and an emergence profile. Great. Thank you. All right, um, that rounds out uh, the questions. Uh, I wanna thank you all for joining today. Um, if you have specific questions about Plenmeca technology um, or specific questions that you might have for, for uh, Dr. Young, please reach out to your Plenmeca um, representative or to your authorized uh, Plenmeca dealer representative. Thank you all for joining and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.